morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. When we last left our hero Paul, we saw him in the prime of his life. His ministry had never been flourishing more. Through his very sweat rags, the sick were being healed. Through his, his faithful ministry, the Ephesians were renouncing their magic tricks, their devotion to profitable silver, their reliance on, on Artemis or, or Caesar or, or other false gods to save them. They were turning entirely to Jesus. And as the word of the Lord prevailed within them, so it prevailed all across the Roman province of Asia. Like we've said before, Acts isn't so much a history of the church as the unfolding of the mission. Now, to the extent that the church is healthy, that's just about the same thing. The story of the church is the story of the mission, if we're healthy. Because the church is a missionary movement. If we are committed to being a healthy church, then we will follow the Spirit out past the stained glass windows into the streets, and we will watch the word of the Lord prevail as well. But Paul could not stay in Ephesus. He couldn't. A riot uh, was stirred up by the pagan silversmith Demetrius. And, and this, this riot, this big hullabaloo, made it impractical for Paul to stick around any longer. Paul would be embarrassing his financial backers too much. He'd be putting himself at serious risk. And he was honored bound to leave. But he did leave a thriving church behind him, and that's what really matters. So in this chapter, Luke begins tracing Paul's journey on. Paul travels through, through Greece and in Macedonia and picks up a number of new companions. And Luke tells us where they're from, too. The, the, these folks are from Thessalonica, Berry, Derby, even Asia itself. There's something Luke doesn't really make too explicit here. Luke doesn't mention it. This is the season where Paul wrote some letters. This is probably when he wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians, maybe a couple others. It's also the season of his life where Paul is gathering a huge offering from the churches he's founded to bring to the Jerusalem church. Now that collection isn't a big theme in Acts, but Paul himself was very passionate about it. In fact, he Paul saw that collection as the final fruit of his ministry. Just as spiritual blessings of Israel had spilled over onto the nations through his apostleship, now those very churches in those Gentile nations would return material blessings back to the heart of Israel. Uh, this would be a vivid symbol of the nations coming obediently to Zion, just like the prophets foretold. And Paul himself looked in the mirror and saw a chosen priest selected by God to present this pure and holy offering from the formerly impure Gentiles and share the offering of the holy ministers of the gospel in Jerusalem as the final clinching sign that out of Jew and Gentile the Lord had made one new to that's big. And Paul is so passionate about that. That's what he's embarking on. In fact, the companions that Paul lists are probably the representatives, the collection agents chosen by each of the churches to carry their offerings on the church's behalf. Luke himself was probably along as a representative of the Philippian church. And so Paul embarks on his last journey. One of his great goals is now within his reach. But of course, on any journey, there are places you must stop along the way. The first place he has to stop after leaving Philippi is naturally Alexandria Troas. It's a settlement on the Turkish coast. It's the site where Alexander the Great left Macedon and invaded the rest of the world. And it was not too far of a boat ride from Philippi, and Paul had been through here before on the way into Macedonia. So there's already a small church set up. And now when he gets here, he, he and his team can only spare seven days, just, just a week. 
He doesn't want to waste a moment. So you're going to have to picture this scene in your mind's eye. They didn't have big fancy church buildings like this one. Not that this is a very big one compared to some of the ones we have as neighbors, but even this is far larger than anything they had. They didn't have stained glass, they didn't have pulpit. Paul and his friends were going to have to cram into a third floor tenement park. And it's a Roman style apartment complex. So Paul's holding a conversation with, with these believers, knowing he's not going to see them again. So any last instruction, any last comfort they need, he has to give it now. So it's no surprise he makes this message along. He preaches until midnight and beyond. Can you believe that? Aren't you so glad this church doesn't know anything about having a long-winded preacher? <laughs> oh, good, you laugh. You know me well enough by now. Luke's audience would not have judged Paul for that. In fact, long speeches were actually very normal for preachers and teachers back then. Uh, even a couple centuries ago, sermons lasting several hours were the norm, even here in America. But they still usually didn't happen in such cramped rooms. Uh, in, in this scene in Troas, everyone is packed into that room like sardines. And, and, okay, what, what, what happens when you stuff a whole crowd of people into a little room, and you light some candles, and, and there's not much in the way of ventilation? It gets hot. Stuffy. Sweaty. People are getting maybe a little bit dizzy. There's so little room that Eutychus is sitting on a broad windowsill. Yeah, it was a big windowsill. That was, this wasn't so unusual. Eutychus is a young man, probably of military age. And Luke's first readers would expect any student to be able to stay away from even a lecture this long. That's just the self-discipline you needed in those days. But Eutychus does not quite measure up that way. He yawns. He feels his eyes dripping closed. He tries to keep them open, but his eyelids are just so heavy. He yawns again. He's peering through Leery eyes, and the room seems like it's dancing. All the candles are flickering and making pretty shadows on the walls, and it's bright. He should be able to stay away, but he's just so sleepy, you know? <laughs> so surely he can let himself not off just this once. And then he drops out the window. Tumbles three stories onto the street or the courtyard below. Can you imagine the dismay running through the crowd in that moment? You have to wonder, you know, uh, he's a young man with his mom and dad in the room. Aunts, uncles, brothers, and sisters, and his childhood best friend was that guy here. And there falls he takes out the window. Well, uh, a bunch of them must have rushed over the window, scrambling past one another to look out. Some, some people run down the stairs as fast as they can go, tripping over themselves, wanting to get to the body, wanting, in their grief, to, to look, to say goodbye. Is he all right? It's a familiar kind of scene. A youth, just, just a kid, gone from this world in an unthinkable way at a very untimely age. We know that story, don't we? Elijah saw it. Elijah saw it. Jesus saw it. Peter saw it. And now Paul sees it. But if you've been paying attention to a lot of the details, there are clues already in the story of what's going to happen. Think about this. Why does Luke take care to mention that it's just past the Feast of Unleavened Bread? 
Why does Luke specify that this scene takes place in the upper room? Where else does that come up in the Bible? Maybe you know. Why does Luke make it clear that this happens on the first day of the week? Can you guess already what he's suggesting? See, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, those are days following Passover when Jesus died on the cross. The upper room, this band of disciples is breaking bread. Well, an earlier band of disciples did that at the Last Supper. And then at the start of Acts, they continued meeting in that very upper room to break bread in light of what happened in the church. And now we've come to the first day of the week. And this is the exact same phrase that Luke uses toward the end of his gospel when he opens what chapter? The first Easter morning. The resurrection of Luke is writing this as a new Last Supper story, a new account of death and resurrection. Luke wants you to hear those echoes. Luke wants you to pick up on, on his literary strategy. He wants you to pay attention to what he's doing here. This story is not going to end with you take a stay dead. It can't. And it doesn't. Paul picks up the young man's body, tells people, don't worry. Now, through these last few chapters, we've seen Paul becoming increasingly like Jesus. And just like Jesus, just like the prophets before him, Elijah and Elisha, Paul yanks this kid out of the Grim Reaper's bony fist. Oh, you take story is not done. There is hope for you take this. The breaking of bread has not come to an end, not even for him. And even death and res restoration cannot impede the witness of the gospel. That's why Paul keeps on talking, keeps on making use of every moment, does not let himself be diverted from his mission by this brief interruption in the case of life. That's a great story. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that this is a Troas? I don't see you take a sitting in one of these views. Why does it matter? Why is it so timely for us to hear that story here and now? Well, you know what tomorrow is. Tomorrow, as we all know, is Memorial Day. On Memorial Day, Americans, our, our friends, our countrymen, our, ourselves, Americans show honor on Memorial Day to those who lost their lives in the course of their military service toward this country. Those who boldly faced peril in air and land and sea. But whether they were among the host of those who loved the vastness of the sky or those who on the ocean fly. I suspect that many of you can think of the name of someone close to you. The, the first person who pops into your mind when I ask, who have you known who died while in the service? Maybe World War II, maybe, maybe Korea, maybe Vietnam, maybe Afghanistan or Iraq, or point elsewhere. Would you please raise your hand if you know someone who died in the course of the service? <laughs> Mark, what name do you think? My uncle Owen. Um, who are you thinking? My childhood neighbor, Joe Howell. Joe, how about you? Guy I served with in the service. He went to Vietnam and was killed over there. His name was Charlie Bell. Carl? What about you? My old brother. Grace, I think you had your hand up. Julie? My brother's best friend in high school, his name was Jim, the same as my brother's name. He went to Vietnam, he came home, but he committed suicide. Also a very real casualty of war in our day. Friends, here before us this morning, we have a story of Paul's departure. This is the last 
may be the last time he will break bread with his friends in Troas. Luke is very intentionally casting it as a last supper. It, it points back to the last supper and the death of Jesus Christ. By this point in the narrative, Paul knows he is not going to make it back to Troas. Ever. Paul has a mission to accomplish. He intends to announce his gospel in Rome, the center of the imperial power, maybe preaching to the very emperor himself if he can, and then God willing to then bring the gospel to the utmost reaches of the West by traveling to Spain. He talks about that in Romans. But for Paul, there's no turning back. For Paul, there is no more revisiting places he's once been, no more seeing old friends. He's making a good walk, goodbye to them. He, he knows the risks of Jerusalem. The, the prophet Agabus will tell him, it's going to be bad, you're going to be handed over to the Gentiles there. Paul doesn't know exactly what's going to happen, but he says, and the speech we'll cover next week, he, he says, the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life as any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and my ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about in the kingdom will see my face again. Paul's right. Acts does not tell us about another trip to Corinth, another visit to Ephesus, another stay in Troas. Paul understands exactly the feelings of every soldier who has ever said goodbye, not knowing that he'll make it back. Paul knows the pain, the wistfulness, the anxious separation that shrouds Memorial Day and all its memories. The scene also tells us that there's more to the story. At the very moment when Luke is preparing his readers, preparing us to watch Paul march out into battle one last time, that preparing us for the fact that Paul would end up a prisoner of war in God's holy campaign against the dominion of darkness. Well, at that very moment, Luke does everything he can to remind us that the death and resurrection of Jesus has consequences for the church. So here Luke harkens back to that central story and shows that Eutychus does not have to stay dead forever. In the instant he fell from the window, the hearts of all those who gathered sank. They sank like the news hitting a father or a mother or, or a sister or a brother, a friend, a spouse or fiance news that their loved one won't come back from that foreign land. Wherever that foreign land was, whether, whether it's the halls of Montezuma or the shores of Tripoli, whether far off northern lands or sunny tropic seas, whether Valley Forge or Custer's ranks, San Juan Hill or Patton's tanks, some just don't come back except in the pine box. If at all. We know that story. And Luke tells us that that sinking feeling does not have to be the last one. The hope for an American soldier is the only hope for all of us as well. And that's to be not just an American soldier, but a Christian soldier. To be enlisted in Christ's holy war against the dominion of darkness. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone under the discipline of Christ's service. Someone exercising the self-control and watchfulness proper to his or her duty in that war. Someone vigilant in the day of battle equipped with God's own armor. A disciple is a Christian soldier. A Christian soldier's fight as such is not against flesh and blood, but against the dark principalities and powers that infect and infest the world. Those forces that dig their, their fierce talons and their fiery darts into our own souls, our own lives and lifestyles. A disciple is a 
Christian soldier. When and where the Son of God goes forth, a disciple follows in his train, even to the cross and beyond. A disciple belongs to the church militant here on earth, and when his or her tour of duty in this world is done, plans to return again with all the church triumphant. Yes, a disciple is just such a Christian soldier. And for no other soldier is there such an immense hope. A certainty, absolute certainty, that like you take us, death is no defeat. Because Jesus Christ, the Lord, has trampled down death by death. And on those in the tomb, he is bestowing the victory of life. By that, you can be more than just a little bit confident. Amen. My hope and prayer today is that for all those American servicemen whose names we shared out loud this morning, that they were also enlisted in Christ's army. Maybe they already were when you said your goodbyes were. Maybe they weren't. I pray they joined up in those last weeks, days, hours, even seconds. You know, the love of God is relentless. And there is no recruiter so tenacious as the Lord Jesus, the commander of the armies of the Lord of hosts. Now, I've got my own private speculations on just how the relentless love of God pursues us, even as we surrender our final breath. But more important and relevant to us today is whether we here, each one of you, myself too, are enlisted in the armed forces of heaven. Armed, not with rifle, but with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to fight against sin's inward summons and the world's outward temptations, against principalities and against powers and against all thoughts and private schemes that set themselves up in opposition to the wisdom of our holy God. Our question this morning is, are you enlisted? Are you just such a Christian soldier? Are you dressed in the uniform that is Christ's righteousness? you have the helmet of salvation on your head, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit in your hand. Are you just such a Christian soldier this morning? And if by any chance you're not, I beg of you, do not leave this building. Do not part from this gathering without having a heart to heart with the recruiter and commander of our souls. Now, I hope you are a Christian soldier, and if you are, then hear this word this morning. March onward. March onward with the cross of Christ crucified being all the banner, all the flag, all the emblem you ever need. No matter whether the American kingdom rises or wanes, the Church of Jesus constant will remain. March on. Sure in the promise that whether you weaken in the struggle like you take us, where you stay strong to the end like Paul, there is a resurrection promise for you. And that promise is that your last break break is only final for now. Death does not get the last word. Tombs are temporary. Because one day we will break bread with Paul and with you take us and our fallen brothers and sisters and friends and best of all, with the Lord Jesus himself. And in that day there will be no need to decorate graves ever again, because there will not be any graves left to decorate. All swords will be beaten into plowshares, all spears beaten into pruning hooks, and the nations shall not learn war anymore. And this promise goes with you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Hallelujah for the gospel of resurrection, the promise of never-ending peace. Amen.
Thanks be to God. Who gives us the victory for our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us bow our heads and pray to this For God so loved the world. For many of us, O oh Lord, these are among the first words we heard about. How true they are and how comforting they can be dawns upon us as we bring ourselves before you in their life. Your care, your provision, your mercy, your internal intentions for our good flow endlessly towards us. For you never change or waver from your loving nature, and so we are blessed. For your gifts, great and small, seen and unseen, we give you thanks. For hope beyond the temporal, for purpose beyond the mundane, and for mercy that triumphs over judgment, we give you thanks and praise your holy and precious name. Our world knows too little of your ways. Even when we speak of your goodness and love, we tend so easily to limit them to our own kind, our own nation, our own families. Yet the wideness of your mercy knows no limits. Teach us your ways, we pray. In this land, we pause over this weekend to remember the casualties of war. It's a hurtful, painful reality in this world. Breaking homes, families, relationships, life itself. Remind us in this hour that it will not have the last word. We pray for those who mourn the deaths of soldiers and civilians caused by human refusal to walk in the way of peace. As we remember, let us also hear anew your word, calling us to reject all thoughts of bitterness, greed, lust, and envy, out of which grow the seeds of war. Forgive us, we pray, as we confess our sins before you. We have not done what we ought to have done. We have done those things we ought not to have done. We have given over our minds to thoughts of other desires than those you have for us. We prefer self over nature, over neighbor. We have not pursued peace with even the members of our own families. Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us, we pray. Renew us in the ways of everlasting life, disentangled from the many roads leading to destruction. Fill us anew with the power of your Holy Spirit to live, even as we pray the prayer taught to us by your Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 